today's lecture we will be looking into central asian contacts and their results okay basically how the indo greeks uh, kushans sakas uh, parthians all these people entered into india okay the period which began in 200 bc did not witness a large empire like that of maurya so this is happening after maurya okay but it is notable that for intimate and widespread contact contacts between central asia and india in the eastern india central india and the deccan the mauryas were succeeded by numerous native rulers such as sangas who came just after mauryas then kanvas were there and then sadavahanas okay in the northwestern india they were succeeded by a number of ruling dynasties from central asia okay who were they that is the indo greeks a series of invasions took place from about 200 bc the first to cross the hindu kush were the greeks okay they ruled bactria okay lying south of the oxus river in in the area covered by the north afghanistan the invaders came one after another but some of them ruled to one at one and at uh, the same time on parallel lines okay they were ruling at the same time okay one important cause of invasions was the weakness of seleucid empire okay there was seleucid empire and what happened is that uh, once the seleucid empire began to weaken the muslim invasion takes place okay when the islamic armies marched into seleucid empire that created a uh, disintegration within the empire and they found that the indian subcontinent was much safer for them okay which have been established in bactria and adjoining areas of iran called parthia on account of the growing pressure from the seleucid tribes sanctian tribes the later greek rulers were unable to hold their power in this area okay with the construction of the chinese wall the sanctians were now not in position to push towards forward into china so what happened they turned their attention towards the neighboring greeks and parthians pushed by the scythian tribes the bactrian greeks were forced to invade india okay another thing is that in the chinese area the uh, creation of the great wall of china they forced a particular tribal groups the scythians to march into uh, to attack the greeks and the parthians so what happened they had to naturally invade india okay the successes of ashoka were too weak to stem the tide of foreign invasions which this is the area of central asian contacts we can find here bacteria is there and uh, then parthia over here okay this is indian territory this is punjab region then farkhana okay all these are uh, central asian contacts okay then in the beginning of the second century bc the indo greeks occupied a large part of the northwestern india okay much larger than that conquered by alexander it is said that they pushed far, forward as far as ayodhya and patliputra but the greeks failed to establish united rule in india the two greek dynasties ruled northwestern india on parallel lines okay and they were ruling at the same time the most famous indo greek ruler was meander or he was called milinda he had his capital in sakala or modern silakot in punjab and he invaded ganga yamuna dob uh, dob basically means the convergence of two rivers in the case ganga and yamuna okay he was he was converted to buddhism by who nagasena who was also known as nagarjuna meander asked these uh, asked nagasena many questions relating to buddhism these questions and nagasena's answers were recorded in the form of a book known as milinda panho or the questions of milinda okay the indo bacterian rule is important in the history of india because of the large number of coins the, in which, which greeks issued the indo greeks were the first rulers in india to issue coins which can be definitely attributed to the kings this is not possible in the case of early punch marked coins which cannot be assigned with certainty of any dynasty the indo greeks were the first to issue gold coins in india who were the first people to issue gold coins in india it was the indo greeks 
which increased in number under the Kushans. So under the Kushans, a large number of coins were issued and the purest of the coins were done by Guptas. Okay. La first issued by Indo-Greeks, then the largest number of coins issued by Kushans and the purest one by uh, later by Guptas. Okay. The Greek rule is also memorable on account of the introduction of Hellenist art features in the northwest frontier of India. Hellenistic means basically the Roman or Greek art features in the northwestern frontier of India. We will look into it in the art and culture uh, which I will put it in the comment section okay, of that video. The Sakas. The Greeks were followed by Sakas, another tribe who controlled a much larger part of India than the Greeks did. There were five branches of the Sakas with their seats of power in different parts of India and Afghanistan. Okay. One branch of the Sakas settled in Afghanistan. Another branch of the Sakas settled in Punjab with Taxila as their capital. A third branch settled in Mathura, where they ruled for about two centuries. A fourth branch established its hold over western India, where they continued to rule till the 4th century AD. A fifth branch of the Sakas established its power in the upper Deccan. Okay, mainly in the North Indian region, they were present and also in Afghanistan and Pakistan region. Okay, Sakas did not meet much effective resistance from the rulers and peoples of India. In about 58 BC, we hear the king of Ujjain who effectively fought against the Sakas and succeeded in driving them out in his time. He called himself Vikramaditya. Okay, Vikramaditya. So, uh, an era called Vikrama Samvat was reckoned in the event of his, his, his victory from Sakas. Okay. From the time onwards, from this time onwards, Vikramaditya became a coveted title. Whoever achieved anything great adopted this title just as Roman emperors adopted the title of Caesar in order to emphasize their great power. As a result of this practice, we have a, as many as 14 Vikramadityas in Indian history. And the title continued to be fashionable with the Indian kings till the 12th century AD. Okay. And it was especially prevalent in the western India and the western Deccan, mainly in the western region. Although the Sakas established their rule in the different parts of the country, only those who ruled in western India held power for any considerable length of time. For about four centuries or so, the most famous Saka ruler of, in India was Rudra. Rudraman. Okay. He ruled not only over Sindh, Kutch and Gujarat, but had also recovered from the Sadhavanas, Kongans, Kongan, Narmada Valley, uh, Malwa and Kataivar. Okay. He was famous in history because of the repairs he undertook in the improved Sudarsana Lake. Sudarsana Lake in the semi-arid zone of Kathiawar. This lake had been in use for irrigation for a long time and was an as old as time of the Mauryas. Rudraman was a great lover of Sanskrit. Although a foreigner settled in India, he issued the first ever long inscription in chaste Sanskrit. Okay, now we all the early long inscriptions that we have in this country are composed in Prakrit. Okay, now other one, the, this inscription was in Sanskrit. Okay, now we have Parthians. The Saga dominion in the northwestern India was followed by that of Parthians. After Sagas, first it was Indo-Greeks, then Sagas, then after that we have Parthians. Okay, in many ancient Indian Sanskrit texts, the two peoples are together mentioned as Saka Pahala, Pahalavas. In fact, they ruled over this country on parallel lines for some time. Originally, the Parthians lived in Iran from where they moved to India. In comparison with Greeks and Sagas, they occupied only a small portion of northwestern India in the first century. Okay, the most famous Parthian king was Gundafaras. Why he was famous? Because at that time, St. Thomas, a disciple of Jesus Christ, is said to have come to India for the propagation of Christianity. In course of time, Parthians like Sagas before them became an integral part of Indian polity and society. Okay. Now we have Kushan, Kushanas. The Parthians followed by were followed by Kushans. 
who were also called yachis or tocharians the kushans were one of the five clans into which the yachi tribe was divided a nomadic people from steppes of north central asia living in the neighborhood of china the kushans first occupied bactria and or north afghanistan where they displaced the sagas gradually they moved to the kabul valley and seized gandhara by crossing the hindu kush replacing the rule of the greeks and parthians in the in these areas finally they set up their authority over the lower indus basin and greater part of the gangetic basin their empire extended from the oxus to the ganga from kharosam in the central asia to varanasi in uttar pradesh that was a vast empire okay now we are seeing the extent of this empire okay a good part of central asia now included in the ussr or russia okay at that time ussr a portion of iran a portion of afghanistan almost the whole of pakistan and also the whole of northern india were brought under one rule of kushans this created a unique opportunity for the commingling people and uh, there was an intermingling of cultures and the process gave rise to a new type of culture which embraced five modern countries so if a question is asked why the kushan uh, kingdom is referred to as that uh, which generated a culture that embraced five modern countries if a question is asked we can write the above said answer we can add it okay we come across two successive dynasties of kushans the first dynasty was founded by a house of chiefs who were called kadfesis and who ruled for 28 years from about 50 ad okay it had two kings first was kandafis 1 who issued coins south of hindu kush he minted coppers in imitations of roman coins the second king was kadfesis 2 who issued a large amount of gold money and spread his kingdom east to the indus so kushans are the ones who issued a large number of gold money the house of confucius was succeeded by kanishka kanishka is another important figure its kings extended the kushan power over upper india and the lower indus basin the early kushan kings issued numerous gold coins with large with higher gold content than is found in the gupta coins although the gold coins of the kushans are found mainly west of the indus their inscriptions were are distributed not only in northwestern india and sindh but also in madura saraswati kasumbi and varanasi hence they had set up their authority in the greater part of the gangetic basin kushan coins inscriptions sculptures and structures found in madura show that it was their second capital in india the first being purushapura or peshwar where kanishka erected a mono, monastery and a huge stupa or relic tower which exist which excited the wonder of foreign travelers the most famous kushan ruler was kanishka although outside borders of india uh, outside the borders of india he seems you have suffered defeat in the hands of chinese he is known to history because of two reasons what were the reasons first he started an era in 78 ad that is now known as saka era kanishka is the responsible for the beginning of saka era okay he is used by the government of india secondly kanishka extended his whole hearted patronage to buddhism he held a buddhist council in kashmir where he where the doctrines of mahayana form of buddhism were finalized kanishka was also a great patron of art and sanskrit literature the successors of kanishka continued to rule in northwestern india till about 230 ad some of them bore typical indian names such as vasudeva okay so they also the kushanas also became indianized okay the kushan empire in afghanistan and in the areas west of indus was supplanted in the mid century ad by sasanian power which rose in iran but kushan principalities continued to exist in india for about a century the kushan authority seems to have lingered in the kabul valley kapisa bacteria khorasan and sangodara identical to bokra and samarkand in the 3rd 4th centuries uh, many kushan coins inscriptions and terracotta has been found in these areas especially at a place called toparkala when uh, toparkala is famous for what it is famous for 
കുഷൻ കോയിൻസ് ഇൻസ്ക്രിപ്ഷൻസ് ആൻഡ് ടെറ കോട്ടേഴ്സ് എൻ്റെ ലാസ്റ്റ് നമ്പർ ഓസ് ദ മാസ് ഫൗണ്ട് ദയർ എസ്പെഷ്യലി ഇൻ ഖൊറാസർ ഓക്കെ ടെറക്കാല ഇൻ ടൊപ്പറക്കാല ഇൻ ഖൊറാസർ എ ഹ്യൂജ് കുഷൻ പാലസ് ഓഫ് ദ തേർഡ് ഫോർത്ത് സെഞ്ചുറീസ് ഹാവ് ബീൻ അണ്ണർത്ത് it housed an administrative archives administrative archives containing inscriptions and documents written in aramic script and khorasan language now what were the impact of central asian contacts okay structures and pottery the saka uh, kushan face registered a distinct advance in the building activities excavations have revealed several layers of structures sometimes more than half a dozen of various sites in north india in them we find the use of burnt bricks for flooring and that of tiles for both flooring and roofing but the use of surki and tiles may not have been adopted from outside okay this is kanishka's coin okay the period is also marked by the construction of brick wells its typical pottery is red ware both plain and polished with medium to fine fabric the distinctive pots are sprinklers and spouted channels they are reminders of red pottery with thin fabric found in the same period of cushion layers in soviet central asia red pottery techniques were widely found known in central asia and they were found even in regions like farghana which were the peripheries of cushion cultural zone now how was the trade and technology at that time sakas and cushions added new ingredients in indian culture and enriched it Im- immensely they settled in india for good and completely identified themselves with its culture since they did not have their script language or religion they adopted these elements of culture from india they became an integral part of indian society so this is very important okay how did the in- invaders found indian how did they became indianized okay these points are very valid and this can be used in your main sense writing okay to which they contributed considerably they introduced better cavalry and the use of riding horses on a large scale okay they made common the use of reins and sandals which appear in the buddhist cultures of the second and third century ad okay the sakas and cushions were excellent horsemen Their passionate love for horsemanship is attested by numerous equestrian terracotta figures in cushion times discovered from Begram in Afghanistan some of these foreign horsemen were heavily armored and fought with spears and laces, lances possibly they also used some kind of toe stirrup made of rope which facilitated their movements the sakas and cushions introduced turban tunic trousers and heavy long coat even now the afghanistan the punjab is wear turbans and the sherwani so these are the contribute contributions of sakas and cushions the central asians also brought in cap helmet and boots which were used by warriors because of these advantages they made a clean sweep of their opponents in iran afghanistan pakistan and india later when this military technology spread in the country the dependent princes turned them to good use against their former conquerors okay the sakas and cushions added had an advantage in the beginning beginnings but once the technology was spread they reached other uh, kingdoms in india the, they took an advantage the coming of the foreigners established intimate contacts with central asia and india as a result india received a good deal of gold from the altar mountains in central asia gold also may have been received in india through trade with roman empire the cushions control the silk route which started from china and passed through their empire in central asia and afghanistan to iran and western asia which formed part of the roman empire in eastern mediterranean zone this route was a source of great income to the cushions and they built a large prosperous empire because of the tolls levied from the traders It is significant that the cushions were the first rulers in India to issue gold coins on a wild a wide scale. Okay. Now we come to polity. Okay. The central Asian conquerors imposed their rule on numerous petty native princes 
This led to the development of a feudatory organization. The Kushans adopted the pompous title of King of Kings, which indicates their supremacy over numerous small princesses. The Sakas and Kushans strengthened the idea of divine origin of kingship. The Kushan kings were called sons of God. This title was adopted by the Kushans from the Chinese, who called their king the son of heaven. It was used in India naturally to stress the royal authority. Okay, the Hindu lawgiver Manu asked the people to respect the king. Why the names of God or a godly character was given to the king? Okay, this reason can be found in the, uh, the Hindu lawyer Manu. Uh, he asked the people to respect the king. Why? Even he is a child because he is a great god ruling in the form of a human being. So, whenever the king was related or uh, compared with God, the people naturally trusted him. They saw that a God is ruling them. Okay, that created a mark of respect for them. Okay, mark of respect or sense of respect. Okay, they also introduced the satrap system of government. The empire was divided into numerous satrapies or uh, counties or states. And each satrapy was placed under the rule of, of a satrap. Each some curious practices such as hereditary dual rule, two kings ruling in the same kingdom at one and the same time were introduced. We find that father and son, father and son ruled jointly at one and the same time. Thus, it appears that there were less centralization under these rulers. The foreigners also introduced the practice of military governorship. This was done by the Greeks who appointed their governors called Citrigos. So, this is adopted by Citrigos. Okay. The military governors were necessary to maintain the power of foreign rulers over the conquered people. Okay. Now, new elements in Indian society. We can say of the Central Asian powers and the Indian society comparison or relation. The Greeks, the Sakas, the Parthians and the Kushans ultimately lost their identity in India. They became completely Indianized in course of time. Since most of them came as conquerors, they were absorbed in Indian society as warrior classes, that is the Kshatriyas. Their placement in the Brahmanical society was explained in a curious way. The lawgiver Manu stated that the Sakas and the Parthians were the Kshatriyas who had fallen from their duties. In other words, they came to be considered as second class Kshatriyas. In it's no other period of ancient Indian history where foreigners assimilated into Indian society on such a large scale as they were in post mauryan times. Okay, now we come to religion. Some of the foreign rulers were converted to Vaishnavism, okay, which means the worship of Vishnu, the god of protection and preservation. The Greek ambassador called Heliodorus, Heliodorus set up a pillar in honor of Vishnu near Vidyasa. Headquarters is Vidhisa district in Madhya Pradesh. Okay. A few other rulers adopted Buddhism. The famous Greek ruler Meander was converted to Buddhism. The questions and the answers exchanged from the Buddhist teacher called Nagasena was also called Nagarjuna constitute a good source of cultural history of the post mauryan period. The Kushan rulers worshipped both Shiva and the Buddha and the images of the two gods appeared on the Kushan coins. Several Kushan rulers were worshippers of Vishnu. This was certainly the case with the Kushan ruler Vasudeva, whose very name is synonym to Krishna, okay, who was worshipped as an incarnation of Vishnu. Okay, the king was considered as an incarnation of Vishnu. The origin of Mahayana Buddhism, the contact with foreigners brought about changes in Indian religions. This especially happened in Buddhism. Buddhism in its original form was too puritical and too abstract to foreigners who wanted something concrete and intelligible. That there were no specifications of what is ahimsa, what is uh, meditation or what is enlightenment. So there was a, no proper idea. So but they wanted, uh, the foreigners wanted a proper idea of this religion. They did not appreciate the philosophical doctrines of Buddhism, emphasis by existing Buddhist schools, they wanted something which they could easily understand and which could satisfy their religious curvings. 
so they developed a new form of buddhism called the mahayana or the great wheel in which the image of buddha began to be worshiped so buddhism now we can see that buddhism is turning into a proper religion it is being structured into a proper religion that is seen today the doors of this sect were open to all sections of the people and naturally uh, those who did not became member of the newly founded sect they were called hinayana or the small wheel fortunately for mahayana the kanishka became a great patron of mahayana he convened a council in kashmir where the buddhist teachings were engraved on sheets of copper and deposited under a stupa he did not know the contents of this inscri- we did not know the contents of this inscriptions because this stupa has been discovered not been discovered so far kanishka set up any stupas in memory of buddha now we come to gandhara art anyway gandhara art will be discussed in art and culture uh, properly anyway we will read through it the foreign princesses became enthusiastic patrons of indian art and literature and they showed the zeal characteristics of new converts the kushan empire brought together masons and other artisans trained in different schools and countries indian craftsmen came into contact with greeks and the romans especially in the northwestern frontier of india in gandhara this gave rise to a new kind of art okay in which images of buddha were made in greco roman style the hair of buddha so we can when asked about the characteristics of gandhara art we can say the hair of buddha was fashioned in the greco roman style the influence of gandhara art also spread to madura along its was primarily a center of indigenous art madura produced beautiful images of buddha but is also famous for the headless erect statue of kanishka whose name is inscribed on its lower part okay it also produced several stone images of vardhamana mahavira the madura school of art flourished in the early centuries of christian era and its products made of red sandstone is found even outside madura okay at present madura museum possesses the largest collection of sculptures of kushan times in india during the same period we notice beautiful works of art at several places some uh, south of the vindhyas beautiful well buddhist caves were constructed out of rocks in maharashtra in andhra pradesh nagarjuna konda and amaravati became great centers of buddhist art and the stories connected with the buddha came to be portrayed in numerous panels okay the earliest panels dealing with buddhism was found in gaya sanchi and barhat and belong to the second century bc but we notice further development in sculpture in the early centuries of christian era okay now this is sanchi stupa image of sanchi stupa okay i have discussed a detail about the stupas and the different uh, parts of stupa this is the image of buddha in gandhara this is gandhara art and sculpture of madura anyway i will discuss all these figures and all de- in detail in when we discuss art and culture now literature and learning the foreign princes patronized and cultivated sanskrit literature the earliest specimen of kavya style is found in the inscription of rudra daman in kathaiwar in the ad 150 from now onwards inscriptions began to be composed of chase sanskrit so in we can say rudra daman was the first to convert uh, write in proper write uh, properly write in sanskrit okay even though he was a foreigner we have discussed earlier in this chapter okay although the use of prakrit in composing inscriptions continued till the 4th century ad and even later it seems that some of the great creative writers writers such as ashokosha uh, enjoyed the patronage of the kushana kushans ashokosha wrote the buddha charita which is a biography of the buddha it also composed saudhanda saudandra nada nanda which is a fine example of sanskrit kavya the progress of mahayana buddhism led to the composition of numerous avandanas most of these texts were composed of what is known as the buddhist hybrid sanskrit their one objective was to preach the teachings of mahayana buddhism to the people some of the important books of the jana were mahavastu and divya vandana vadana the foreigners also contributed to the development of indian theater by introducing the use of curtain okay since the curtain was borrowed from greeks it came to be known as yavanika 
This word is derived from the term Yavana, which is Sanskritized form of Ionian, a branch of the Greeks known as the San, in, known to the ancient Indians. Okay, at a later stage, the term Yavana came to be used for all kinds of foreigners. Okay, this is a panel from Bahat. This is silver coins. Science and technology. Science, the Indian astronomy and astrology profited from the contact with the Greeks. We notice many Greeks terms used the movement of planets in Sanskrit text. Indian astrology came to be influenced by Greek ideas and from the Greek term horoscope was derived the term horasastra used for astrology in Sanskrit. However, Indians did not owe anything striking to the Greeks in medicine, botany and chemistry. We were actually concerned or more related to the nature than the Greeks and Greeks were good astronomers that we can accept. Okay, but when it comes to nature, we are the number one. Okay, these three subjects were dealt with Charaga and Sustra. Charaga Samhita contains the names of numerous plants and herbs from which drugs could be prepared for the use of patients. This process laid down for the pounding and mixing of plants gave us idea of the developed knowledge of chemistry in ancient India. For the cure of ailments, the ancient Indian physician relied chiefly on plants for which the Sanskrit word is Aushadi and as a result medicine itself came to be known as Aushadi. Okay. In the field of technology also the Indian seems to have profited from contact with the Central Asians. Kanishka is represented as wearing trousers and long boots. Possibly practice of making leather shoes began in India during this period. Okay. In any case the cushion copper coins in India were imitations of the Roman coins. Similarly, gold coins in India were struck by cushions in imitations of Roman gold coins. We hear two embassies being exchanged between the Indian kings and the Roman kings. Embassies were sent from India to the court of the Roman Emperor Augustus in AD 27 to 28 and also to Roman Emperor Trajan okay, in AD 110 to 120. Thus, the contacts of Rome with ancient India may be introduced, uh, may have introduced new practices in technology. Working in glass during this period was especially influenced by foreign ideas and practices. In no other period in India did glass making make such progress as it did during this period. Okay, so with that we conclude the chapter on Central Asian contacts and their results. So I hope today's lecture was productive for you guys. So until next time we meet again. God bless you all. Jai Hind.